called The Pursuit of Happiness. And um, it's, it's a way and an approach to deal with adversity, challenges in our lives. Um, my intention is to reveal that which is already within. Simcha, deep happiness, is not something that is acquired. It's merely something that has to be brought out. We all have it. Sometimes it's just a matter of realizing what it takes to bring that out into the open. The, the shir, the series, will be L'zeich Nishmas Reb Meir Zisol Ben Yechesko. I'll, I'll begin by saying that when, that when I had the, when I was offered the opportunity to teach, and I thought of, to do it about this topic, I had no idea the, the time that we'd find ourselves in, A, to three weeks, but B, of course, a mass of the situation in Israel. And, um, and I have to say on a personal level, that for me it's also a, uh, let's call it a challenging time. My father was, was nifted just a few weeks ago. I'm still in the Shloshim. Thank you. And, um, and, and it really it brought the, you know, everything that I've been teaching and, and, uh, and working on all these years, it really, I, I, I experienced, you know, the test in real time, if you will. And uh, I think the approach that, I, that I've taken, uh, that we'll see hopefully within this class, I think really, really did help. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about my father, if you, if you don't mind. He had a disease called Lou Gehrig's disease. Uh, it's ca called ALS. And that's a disease where one loses all voluntary muscles. It's the brain sends, in layman's terms, the brain sends messages to various muscles. When that doesn't function properly, so the muscles don't get their, um, the nutrition that they need and eventually muscles start to ba basically die out. And it's a slow process, and it took about, it really took you know, like three years since, since the time that he was diagnosed. But it really was, I mean, it's a most, in, if, I, if you will, incredible disease in that, in that it doesn't affect the mind, so the person knows exactly what's going on, but slowly he watches himself lose, if you will, all the brachas that we take for granted day to day. I'll, I'll never forget that we made, we made a rotation, my siblings and I. Uh, I have a sister and a brother, and every Shabbos, the families would move into my parents' house. My father was at home. Most of the day, he would be in a chair. He, you could, you could, near the end, he could hardly move. And, um, and we would take, we'd make this rotation and spend Shabbos together with him, each of our respective families. Um, a one Shabbos meal, and this was going back not so long ago, maybe six months ago, I sat, we couldn't sit near him really because he was in as big as a comfortable chair for him, but he, he couldn't sit in a dining room chair anymore. So we brought the table to him in the family room and we sat around that table. And he was kind of at the head, but I couldn't really sit near him. And in the middle of the, the suda, the meal, so I got up and I sat beside him and um, like on the couch sort of. And he looked around and he said, he says, I have so, I have so much to live for. I have so much to live for. I don't want to go. And, and I realized what's going on here. Here's someone that's paralyzed from the neck down, but a mask on his, on his face constantly because he needed that to help him breathe. He couldn't eat properly. In the, in the few moments that he could take the mask off, he would e eat as quick as he could. You know, he's, he's always, you know, he couldn't, he, he wasn't outside for, for two years. You know, you couldn't get, you know, difficult for him to get outside. Here's a person that has 99.9, .9, that we have 99.9 .9 of the brachas that he doesn't have. And yet here's someone that doesn't, that wants to live. The, 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 the small percentage, if you will, the brachas, of the, of the blessings that Hashem gives us are enough that a person wants to live, wants to be alive, wants to enjoy this world. That was, that was a, an important lesson I, I took from my father in, in, the, when in the end, he was in the hospital for the last seven weeks um, in, in ICU, but um, when they admitted him, they, um, they, they said, where are the antidepressants? <laughs> where are the antidepressants? Because someone at this advanced stage of ALS normally would have a lot of antidepressants. The person can't move anymore. He's paralyzed and he knows exactly what's going on. And they were astonished to find out that he hardly was using any. And uh, I think this really brings a point home that, um, that, that we have so many brachas in our life and it's really just what we focus on. 
It's what we focus on. If we, if we, if we can focus on the 99.9 .9 that, that we wish we had, or the 0.1 is enough to, to, to lead a life of simcha and inner joy. Uh, the shiva was, uh, was you know, quite a, a moving experience to say the least. The, actually, the, the day I, I got up from shiva was the day we heard that the, that the three boys, unfortunately, were, were found. So it's been, it's been a, a, a trying time. If, if I may, though, I'd like to have someone to read. I wrote, let's begin like this, if you don't mind. I wrote a paper, it's going to be published in Toronto Family Magazine, um, about my experience during Shiva. Is there anyone that, well, no, it's going to be hard for me to read it, but is anyone, would you mind? Okay. Yeah. Reflections on the week of Shiva. I look up and smile as yet another person approaches her eyes meeting in an awkward glance, a moment frozen in time. Words are not spoken, but I'm immediately comforted by the embrace of his gaze. My thoughts wander as I relive the uneasiness that I've experienced at every shiva that I ever attended. I know that I, that I am now that very same hopeless mourner that I have visited over the years. In this flash, I recognize how heartwarming it is that so many have gone out of their way putting themselves in a difficult position to bring me Nechama. Through their discomfort, my pain is alleviated and I am consoled. All of this occurs in an instant, and I initiate the conversation with the man now seated before me. The week of Shiva is a whirlwind of visitors, Minyanim, Kaddish, and emotions. It all feels so surreal. I just stood at my father's bedside, anticipating that he would open his eyes at any minute. Little did I know that it had already been divinely decreed that my father's beautiful, shimmering blue eyes would remain forever closed. The time was chosen for my father retur to return his pure neshama back to his maker. It is this day that henceforth will hold incredible meaning, the day of my father's yurtzeit. Less than a week ago, I watched the numbers on the hospital monitor slowly fall as my father took his last breath unconscious without pain or discomfort, venturing from a peaceful state to a tranquil world. However, as recent as that moment in time it is, it is a blurred vision compared to the vivid image of my father in full vigor, seated so near at the head of the Shabbos table. He is beaming, soaking in every minute of delight. I can clearly see him bigger than life itself, his face aglow with joy, a simcha palpable to all that sit in his presence. This is the fondest memory of my youth, and it is my most dear recollection in adulthood. It is this pristine and indelible stamp that my father forever left on my family and I. My young son stumbles into the room. He does not understand what is going on, but his stare speaks volumes. I recall standing over my father for the last time, peering down, but looking up to my towering hero with the eyes of a child. I am in my 40s, but I will always see my father with the same wonder and admiration with which my four-year-old son now looks at me. Before I can fully collect this thought, another man walks into the room. He slowly takes a seat at the side and smiles with kind eyes. Directly in front, people are making friendly conversations. I respond, but my attention remains fixated on the man's comforting expression. Many come and go, but he remains quietly seated in the back. It is said that Shiva protocol dictates that a visitor, sh a visitor should stay about 15 minutes. However, this is different. As he sits quietly for almost an hour, I learn an invaluable lesson. Care is not articulated in words. It is expressed through effort. According to his commitment to alleviate my pain, my grief is diminished. The greatest comfort comes from those that put in the most effort. Nothing can compare to the same day flight from New York that my brother-in-law and nephew took to be by my side for an hour. As the week comes to a close, it is human nature to take notice of those whose visits were anticipated but never happened. I too have missed shivas for one reason or another, despite the best of intentions. Certainly this is how our loved ones would like us to relate to their absence. The week amidst all the sorrow and crying is ironically an incredibly positive experience. 
a less affiliated relative comments to my wife, Kanina, that a halachic seven-day shiva is so meaningful, it allows one to heal like none other. She expresses how blessed we are to be part of such a beautiful community and explains that in her circles, she unfortunately would not experience the same level of support. The end of shiva is upon me. I take those momentous steps outside the house, embarking on a personal journey forward. The day is filled with the light of a new sunrise, new opportunities, and a new perspective. Together, the family escorts the Neshama to the next station in the world above. May my dear father, Reb Mayor Zizel Ben Yechezko, Sidney Zines, Aleva Shalom, continue to soar through the heavens. Amen. Okay. So let me begin by asking you for a definition of what a ordeal is. And there's, there is a key, a key um, aspect that I want to bring out here. But help me, help me out here. People that experience an ordeal, what, how would you describe that? What's the definition of what an ordeal is? I think of ordeal, I think of it in, in a negative sense. Right, okay. I think of it as something challenging, Good. something uh, hard for me to deal with emotionally. Okay, good, good. Anyone else? Outside the boundaries that you know. Okay, good, I like that, good, okay. Outside, okay out of your comfort zone. Okay, good. Good, good, good. Something good. unexpected. Sometimes, right. Okay, good, good. Something you haven't dealt with before. Okay, yeah, yeah, could be. yeah, definitely. So I, I think all of you, and you'll see, I think it could be there's a common denominator of all of you. An ordeal is, and I, I didn't see this in the dictionary, but if, just through, through a general knowledge of, of the concept, and through Torah um, ideas, is, would be that an ordeal is a lack. It's when something's lacking. And you have a desire to fill that lack. And the inability or the struggle to fill that lack would be, would be the ordeal that one would experience. Can, can you hear that? Yes. Yeah? Now, that's an important definition because, th like I said, simcha is an in a innate um, property that, that, that a person has naturally. And therefore, therefore, even when a person experiences tremendous lack, tremendous challenge, that simcha is always there beneath the, beneath the surface, always, always. Right, and that means that, that no matter what is going on in a person's life, there, can, there is always a level of fulfillment and meaning, no matter how difficult the challenge may be. This, is this making sense? Yeah? I heard, um, I, <laughs> it's a funny, it's a funny uh, concept, uh, idea I heard from, from a rabbi that was teaching guys that were, that were um, a group of guys that were, some were married and some, some weren't. And, and some, some of the guys felt that they were getting a little older, while others had just gotten married. And so it's a bunch, let's say, I don't know how old the group is, probably somewhere in, in, in their 20s and 30s. And he said to them, I'm going to tell you a, a Gemara. All those that are not married are totally going to get this Gemara. And all those that are married are not going to understand at all what the Gemara is saying. Okay? The Gemara is as follows. The Gemara is, there's a Gemara in Shabbos, that the happiness of one's heart is his wife. <laughs> in other words, before a person is married, so when he gets married, it's just it's going to be amazing. He's, that's all he needs to be besimcha. That's all he needs to be happy. Yeah. Once he gets married, he thinks, one second here. I, I'm not happy. Well, what happened? <laughs> now what he doesn't realize is he's that same guy before that was positive he was going to be married. So what happened? So of course it's not the wife. We're not bashing the wife here. It's intrinsically his issue. If he would have been happy before, he'd still be happy afterwards and vice versa. The marriage or whatever that thing is that we feel we are lacking, whatever it is, will not, it may fill the void, but we will not feel fulfilled, right? It could fill it up to a degree, but we're never going to feel like it's all, it's all we need. We have to have that to begin with. Is this making sense? And to give a, you know, another analogy that, that, that's obvious is that when a person, you know, has, wants clothes, or wants a car, or wants things, we all know those things will not make him happy. They're, they're outside himself. 
right? They're just you can you can acquire anything outside yourself, and sometimes these challenges are to fill something or fill up something outside yourself, or want, if you will, outside yourself. But we know that that won't change who you are internally, who you are within, right? You can pile up anything you want, but that doesn't change who you are. Okay. It's important to understand that, that the neshama, which is, and I love asking this question because it's something we talk about all the time, what is, and can someone define what a neshama is for me, what a soul is, definition? The Babishers are excluded because this is like, <laughs> this is like the basics. Yeah, it's the godly part of us, but yeah. it's inside of our body, it's Perfect. close inside of our body. Very good. It's, it's called chelik elokamimal, and in the words of the Balatanya Mamish, it, it is an absolute part of Hashem himself. Now, that's the thing we're lugging around, right? Now we know what that thing is. Now, that, that neshama is, is absolutely positive. There's no negativity there, right? It, it, in many ways, it's always, it's always fulfilled. We just have to tap into to that energy. And, and inherently, we are positive people. We are. It's, it's the opposite. It's, 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 it's those that, that, if you will, it's when society gets gets the better of us that we turn into negative people. A, a, a baby is a positive creature. <laughs> we're born positive. And, and even, even in, throughout life we're positive. If I would give you, if I would show you a glass of water, half filled, right, what would you say? It's half filled or half empty? Most people say it's half filled. Of course it's half filled. A child would certainly say, what, if I say, what's this? The child would say, this is a half filled bottle of water. What's the problem? It's not even saying it's a half empty bottle of water. No one's going to say that. So we, we have it. We, and that's because we, our Hashem is pure and good and, and, and sees what's good in the world. And Hashem is all good. Unfortunately, what happens is we start, in life, we start to have expectations and needs. And, and sometimes that becomes the focus of uh, our reality. Right? We, 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 start to, we start to forget or start to focus on those things that that aren't what we really need or, or aren't who we really are, right? And that's, that's really the challenge, if, if you will, of every ordeal. It's to, it's to determine exactly, well, what's, what's the lack here? What am I lacking? And, 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 and how important is it to me <laughs> if I'm lacking, right? That's, what, that's what's going on. In other words, we, we, everyone struggles, and, and I'm going to explain how, why it's, 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 it's normal to struggle. There's nothing wrong with it. But putting things in perspective, is, is trying to figure out, okay, yes, I understand there's a lack, I have a challenge, there's a lack. What exactly is it that I'm lacking? And, and am I going about it in the right way? You know, if a person, for example, again, this is very obvious, uh, this is an ob obvious example, but if a person, for example, you know, is unhappy and he pursues Gashmias, physicality, when really he needs fulfillment and to feel, to feel connected and to feel godly, it's not going to work. So he, he has this void, he just doesn't know how to fill it. He's right, there is a void, he's, he's missing out, he's, something's not there, but he's going about it the wrong way. Okay, so now what I want to try and examine is um, an idea that I've been writing about, um, and, and it's a deep, it's a very deep Kabbalistic um, idea at its core. It's, it's, a, it's a concept brought, it's a concept that's discussed in Yechezkel Hanavi's Yechazkel the Prophet's vision called Maisa Merkava, which is the, the workings of the Divine Chariot, of Hashem's Divine Chariot. And it's there, you can see it right in Tanakh. Um, it's in, um, it's in right at the beginning of the Yechazkel. And Yechazkel peers into the heavens, and the heavens open up for him. And he sees this incredible vision of what's going on above. And he sees angels running back and forth, and he sees angels with wings and fiery angels, and he sees the Mars, and he sees the, the Hashem's throne, and and it's very vis vivid. It's an amazing, it's a beautiful, beautiful explanation and 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 um, elucidation of what's going on there, what Yechazkel sees. Like I said, it's called the Meister Bekava, um, and that is a phrase used for the entire, for all of Kabbalistic literature. Because in this vision, there are incredible secrets that, that really go across the spectrum of, of the deeper wisdom. Rashi says over there, actually, that when it talks about what's on above the throne, 
They, they, they see a Shem, Shem's throne and then discuss what's on top of the throne. Rashi says, we're not allowed to discuss that. We can't talk about it any further. Never seen Rashi do that. We can't discuss this any further. So there are amazing, amazing secrets in, in this vision of Yicheskel. Amazing secrets. What we're going to do is we're just going to take out a couple words from this whole, and you'll see it goes on for quite a while. Um, and and we'll, we'll hopefully glean some, I think, very important ideas pertaining to what we're discussing. Now the key words here are Ratzai Vishayv. Ratzai means to run. Yechaskel sees, Lachim sees angels running forward, and Shayv, and they retreat back. Shayv means to return, like, like Tshuva, Shuv, to return back. And that's really all the material, that's really all we have. The deeper wisdom goes into a lot of detail of what, what this is. What is this dynamic of Ratzai Vishayv? Running and returning, what's going on, what is it? And it's explained that it's not just the way the angels, <coughs> the angels um, approach godliness. It's not just the way that they, they minister in, in heaven. But it's, it's a dynamic that's seen across, across the globe, across, across, all of, across, across the universe. And it explains, deeper within it explains that this is the way the worlds were created. It's the, it's, it's the heartbeat, the back and forth. It's, it's a pulse, it's the waves of the ocean that go back and forth, and it's the wind, and, it's, and, and you'll see it's, it's the challenges in, in life that we experience, that sometimes we feel we're on top of the world, there are other times we feel like, like the ground beneath us is crumbling. It's all, the root of all of the above is, is this concept of Ratsa Vishayf. Again, it's running and then it's retreating. It's a running and retreating, it's a constant back and forth that we are always experiencing. The, the angels are described as, as running towards Hashem because they have this unquenchable uh, desire to, to, to get as close as they can to Hashem. They can't help themselves. And they run with everything they have, if you will, to get as close as they can to Hashem. What happens is, that when they get incredibly, when they get close, if you will, quote unquote, it's all relative, but when they get close, they are overwhelmed by the light and they're thrown back. Okay, that's how it's described. That's how this scenario is described. They have a desire, a deep, deep desire to cleave to Hashem, and as soon as they get close, they get thrown back. Okay? Now, to put this perhaps in a modern day analogy, I would describe it as a moth, and I'm sure we've all seen this, that flutters to the light. <laughs> Once it gets to the light, or sometimes it'll touch the light, it, it gets burnt or, get, or it experiences shock because it's too hot, and it falls down, right? Only, the, thank you, a minute later, or a moment later, it'll, it'll start to, 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 to fly back, right? <laughs> This is the story, if you will, of our lives. We're always trying to achieve, to get higher, to fulfill a void. Um, and, and the way that the way that reality presents itself is that by the, when we get there, we will immediately be thrown back. It's the back and forth that we will feel in every situation. As soon as we get there to where we think we want to be, we're going to feel that, that one second there's a tremendous void here. Something's not right. Something not. It reminds me of, reminds me of um, an outreach. I, I, I had a, uh, a Rebbe who was, who was in a outreach, and he described to me that very often in outreach, they're most successful with college students near the end of their term. That's, what he, that's how he saw it. And he said because they're working their whole lives towards a degree, you know, and sometimes people are thinking about it, you know, already, uh, you know, early in, in elementary school, you know, what they want to do, where they want to be. And here they are, they're so close to getting it. And they realize that, you know what, this is what it was all for. <laughs> this is not what I want. This is not it. And therefore, they look for, to be fulfilled in other ways, hopefully, you know, in a positive Torah way. But, and this is very often how, how life works, that, that we're striving towards something that we know we want, and all of a sudden, we, we may get there, and then we, it's, it's like shock, and we get thrown back. What I want to do is, is uh, I have, I'm writing a paper on, on this concept of Ratzavashayv. 
I want to try and read you um, just a paragraph or two. We'll, we'll, I want to start with, with, the, with what Ratsa is. And, um, and we can stop and discuss. But let me, just, let me just go through the paragraph and then we'll, we'll go back. Ratsa means to run. It shares a, a common root as well with the word ratsain, meaning, meaning desire or will. Simply put, a person <coughs> runs after his desires, whether towards altruistic or selfish, selfish pursuits. Ratsai is the instinctual and powerful yearning to achieve and to, to exceed expectations. Nothing stands before will. In Hebrew. It is a capacity to jump into a new opportunity, to expand horizons, and to go beyond the self. Ratsai is the drive to increase, to conquer, and to influence another. Okay, did you get a general, did that, did that give a general idea of what this is? It's, it's a, in general, it's a desire for something more than what you have, right? And we all, and by the way, this idea of Ratsai Vashayv is in every single person, and very often we experience it, we can experience it in a moment, it's breathing in and out, in, it may be, perhaps breathing in would be the desire for more, and out is, okay, I had enough. Um, and, and it can be in a lifelong um, relationship. Some, there, are, there are stages of Ratsa and stages of Shaif. And, and, and we, we can hopefully, we'll, we'll go into some of this. But what's important to, to get here is that running and desire are, come from the same roots. Rats in Hebrew is to run. Desire is ratzain. And simply put, a person runs, as I said, runs after his desires. Okay? Now, I see that you guys have a bit of a background in the deeper uh, wisdom. So let me, let me tell you a, an idea that um, pertains to desire. It's explained that when Hashem desired to create the world, before that point, there was an or pashit. The deeper wisdom describes reality as being a single quote-unquote light. That means that Hashem was absolutely everywhere equally. Right? There was no up or down, there was no right or left. Hashem was one reality that took all of reality up. The question that's posed by, by the Mekubalim is if Hashem was everywhere, where did he put the world? In other words, there was, there's no room for a world when Hashem fills all of reality. And it, it's explained that there was something, something trans, transpired, and, and it's called the Tzimtzum. That means that godliness folded up and allowed there to be, if you will, an empty, a vacated space in the middle. And within that vacated space, Hashem created the world, reality, as we know it. Now here's the point I want to bring out. Ratzain is his desire, was, or let's use this analogy, was Hashem's desire to create the world. The moment that Hashem had the desire to create, that created a void, if you will, within himself. Okay? The desire, in other words, when a, let me put it in another way. When a person desires something, immediately a void will open up within himself. Because until he has that thing, the void isn't filled. Uh, are we, is this, are, we, are we following this? So the beauty of this concept is that where did this symptom, this open, this cavity, this void, where did, where did it come from? It came from Hashem himself. It's, 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 it's Hashem's desire, if you will, not being fulfilled until he could put a world within it. Yeah, that is, the, the symptom is, is Hashem's desire to, 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 to fill a world. And, and why that's important on a practical level is, like I said, that any time we desire something, immediately within us will be this void. And the question is how we fill that void, right? Now, okay. go ahead, please. Void comes after desire. Void is, it, it happens at the same moment. The moment you have a desire, the void is opened up. The desire precedes the void. No, I think it happens at the exact same moment. The moment that there's a desire, the void opens. It doesn't exactly precede it. It, it. it happens at the same time. When there's a desire, there's a void. It happens right away. And that means, that means anything, well, you think of it like chocolate cake. You know, you see that, you see that cake, you want it, right? Immediately, you, you, you feel like there's something lacking until you have it, right? 
Good. Now, how, how are we doing? Should I read this paragraph again? Do we get a, an understanding of what Ratzay is? Are we okay? Or should I read it again? Are we okay? We're good. Now, this, one of these, Ratzay and Shaiv can be divided in male and female. Can anyone guess which one this one is? You think it's a woman? Mm hmm. Anyone else? I can hear what you that the woman is probably the Raza and the man is probably the shoe. What is it called? Shoe. Shoe. Like to go back. To return. Shoe. Oh, shoe. I just said, theologically, it's the woman who just wants to talk and the man who retreats. Okay, okay. Okay, okay. Okay, okay. There's no question about it. There's male and female in everyone, right? It's explained that this is that the Ratsa is actually the male dynamic. Okay, <laughs> the and you'll see once I start to once I go into Shaiv, I think it'll become clear why Shaiv is definitely is definitely female. Um, how how can I put this? Um, you know what? Let's go on. I think once once we go through Shaiv, I think Ratsa will become more understood. Okay. Now uh, let me read Shaiv. Shaiv means to return. It is a power of retreating from a former position. Right? You remember the angels run towards Hashem and are then thrown back, okay? To use contemporary, contemporary sport imagery, if rata is offense, shayv is defense. Well, rata is the exer exertion of one's will to initiate, to forge forward, and to attack. Shayv is the reverse. Shayv is a fourth reality when a player is compelled to pull back, often while being caught off guard. At this instant, one must find the innate ability to react when being threatened and when put in a disadvantage. Show you a time when self-confidence and the determination to endure are put to the test. Okay, let me let me continue. And this is uh, this is really this is really the, the important part. A sports analogy may be a good way to begin our discussion on Shoif. However, fundamentally, it is not an accurate metaphor, as a player's c capacity to win or lose is a direct consequence of the opposing team's ability or inability. Correct? In other words, a player can only a player only wins a game dependent on how good the, the opposing team is. Right? However. Shoiv at its core is the realization that self-worth is determined by, by one's inherent greatness and not by another's success or failure. The root of Shoiv is Shef, and it means to sit, right? It, it, is pro, it is a private time spent in calm reflection and inner work. It is an opportunity to take, to take a step back and to simply be, to live in the moment, not striving for something one is not, nor for a thing one does not have. Shaiv is the capacity to recharge and to return to one's true self. Now, does this, is, this, is this making sense at all? Do you see a connection perhaps to a woman here? Yeah. Yeah? yeah? How so? <laughs> um, just really odd. It's home, uh, home fires are burning. The home fires are burning, you know, the woman's at home. Okay, okay. good, good. The, the well-being of... Good, and, and, and the expression in, in, in Chazal is, she's called the Ikeris Habayis, which means the Iker, the main, the mainstay of the home, which means the founda foundation of the family. Okay, very good, very good. A anyone else? Huh? Well, let's put, you know what, I'm, I'm wondering if I should ask this question, or, okay, let me ask the question. How do you see within the, the, the female um, reality? Where do you see this really coming, coming to, well, wh let me put it this way. How do you see the, the greatness of a woman is in Shaif? Because the greatest thing that a woman can do is, is develop what is innately within her, okay? That is something a man cannot do. Does anyone have any idea what I'm talking about? Birth. Birth. Good. Very nice. That was good. I tried. So I thought to give it away and you know to say it in the right way. So okay, perfect. Her, her, and this is the inner. This is, and in case you haven't gotten, this is the inner beauty of a woman. This is sneeze. This is modesty. This is her greatness is within. The man, the man's power. The man is at the top of his game. Game, quote unquote, when he's forceful, when he's out there in the world, when he's conquering, right? That's, when, uh, that's, that's the image of a man, right? That's, why, that's how he feels, like he's really, you know, make, making an impact. Well, the woman just the opposite. The woman's greatness is all within. 
It's, remember what we said, simcha is something innate, it's something deep within, right? This is exactly what, what Shoiv is. Shoiv is going deep within, finding the answers within. You know, they, they, they say in the analogy of a person that travels the world to, to, find, to find himself, right? And, and meanwhile, he had it all within him the entire time, right? So here's someone that, that's going, if you will, the man is searching, looking everywhere to, to find what's going to make him happy. Meanwhile, the woman just looks within to find it, right? Like I said, again, all this dynamic is, is in with each and every one of us. But typically, I'm, gonna do, I'm dividing this in, in male and female. And actually, you know, this, this concept would, would predate even the first man. There's a concept of Ratsa before Adam, Adam was created, right? So, it, but but it's, 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 it's a male and female at, at its root. Shalev is a challenge to preserve when one's devotion and faith are put to the test amidst extreme conditions and limitations. It is the metamorphosis that occurs within the cocoon. It is pregnancy, contraction, and the inner beauty of a woman. Shalev is connected to the negative mitzvahs of the Torah that do not necessitate an action. The expression is Sheva al Tase. You know, I, uh, you know, the, the time I, I, I um, the time before so, before a person's loved one is buried, a person called an oining. That's a, a special halachic status where a person is not does not perform mitzvahs. It's a very very strange thing, you know, and because the one mitzvah you have is to make sure that 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 your loved one is buried. It's very strange. You don't daven, um, you don't make brachas. Uh, very, very strange. Of course, you're not allowed to do a veil against sin, but in that way. But but you don't do positive mitzvahs. And that status is referred to as shev the al tase, to sit and not to do. Right here again, the, the shev is the same root as shev. Well, before we said, if you remember, we said ratza is is a positive commandment. It's doing, right? It's outward. While shev is is more inward. Okay, um, okay, and the shoiv dynamic at its root is the embodiment of our of our patriarch Yitzchak. Now, did I? I'm not sure if I read the whole Ratzai earlier. Did I say that Avram is connected no. to Ratzai? I didn't say that. Okay, so let's backtrack a little bit. Ratzai is is the ability or the capacity to accomplish, and therefore it would correspond to positive mitzvahs, in particular to Avram Avinu, to Avram the patriarch. And Avram's name actually is, is a gematria, is 248, which is the number of positive mitzvahs in the Torah. Well, Yitzchak is just the opposite. In fact, if you, if you look at Yitzchak's life, you'll see how, how um, passive he always is. You'll see, you'll see Avram, is, you know, <laughs> Avram is taking Yitzchak onto the Akedah, onto the top of the mountain, and he's making converts, and he's taking on the world. And Yitzchak, you'll see, is entirely different. Everything changes by Yitzchak. You know, Avram had, had thousands and thousands of, of students, and Yitzchak had one. Yeah, that's, <laughs> you know, everything changes. You'll see his entire life is passive. During the brachas, right, the whole, everyone's trying to, 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 to influence him, and he's, he's being very passive through that whole, eventually he gives the brachas, but he's not in control, if you will. Right, in the yekeda, right, when, he, when his father's going to shecht him, right, also you see Yitzchak is the image of, of being passive. But that's a female dynamic. Avram always represents the male, and Yitzhak the female, if you will. Now, I don't want, I, I don't like passive because it has a negative connotation. I, I don't mean it in that way at all. Just the opposite. Very often there's a time that, that a person has to retreat, has to refuel. That's, that's, that's what's going on. In other words, the way I see this is that, you know, it says that it's clear that Avram made thousands of gerim, of converts. Yet we know that when we went into, into Mitzrayim, we went with only 72 neshamas, 72 souls. What happened to all those thousands of converts? I don't know. I don't, I, I've never heard anyone address it. I don't know. It seems like they faded away. Which may be why Yitzchak said, one second. Now it's time to reassess. In other words, Avram had this, 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 perhaps, this concept like, let's get as many as possible, which is quanti quality, quantity. Well, Yaakov might, Yitzchak might have been quantity. You know, I'm just going to work with one. Let's work with Yaakov. I'm going to do it right and, and put it all my kochas there. Right? It's, it's, in many ways, you see this if you will, um, again, I'll, I'll go back to the male and female dynamic, that a man wants to conquer. He wants, you know, if it was up to the man, he'd marry as many women as absolutely possible, right? That, if it was up to him. Well, the woman takes, and, and more, the, 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 the man has infinite potential to, 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 pro, uh, produ to produce um, a child. Well, the woman takes one 
spark of inspiration and worked with that one spark to make it great, right? Um, that's the difference here. So, so now it's important to know, I have to say, that, that both these dynamics are utterly important or you wouldn't have a child, all right? You need both these dimensions. But, but very often the shoiv aspect becomes the one that, that is, is looked upon as, as a negative. Because in the shoiv dynamic, there's a lack. Something seems to be lacking, apparently. Ratsa is, I'm taking on the world, I'm charged, I'm excited, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, 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 gonna, I'm gonna become something. Shoiv is all of a sudden, everything seems like, everything stops, and all of a sudden, you know, I gotta try and make the best of what I have. Right, so it can seem like a negative, but it, it, in essence, in the shoiv dynamic is what, when it all happens, it's what makes us great. You know, when everything's, when everything's working out exactly the way we want things to work out, we, we're, not, we're not becoming a better person. <laughs> it's, it's when we have challenges, that's exactly when our greatness comes out. Agreed? Yeah? That's, that's what Shoiv is about. It's, a, it's really about achieving our true inner greatness that can only be experienced when we're suffering through an, or, an ordeal. Now, I wonder if I, what's, what's the timing like? How, how are we doing? Till nine, okay, we're good. I think we're good. Are we good? <laughs> are we okay? Are we, are we, we're following, okay? Let me, let me try, let me try and take this to the next level. You know, before I do that, let me pose a question for you. Which one is weekday and which one is Shabbos? Shabbos, Shabbos, Shabbos. Shabbos, yeah. It's actually the same root. Shev, to sit, same root. One is, you know, the weekday is compared to Aritz, to land. Shabbos is c compared to Shemayim, to heaven, right? Aritz is, is, has the same root of Ratz, means to run. And during the week, which is Aritz, which is land, we're always running. We have no manuva. We're running to achieve we're running right, to accomplish, we're running from one meeting to the next, from one email to the next. The, the mode of the weekday is to run, right? to run to accomplish. It's almost like we're, we're running in circles. Shabbos, all of a sudden, everything stops. Right? I'll, ne I'll never forget. The, um, the, the, I, had, I, I invited someone today, Baruch Hashem, he's, he's, he's from, but I, he spent the first Shabbos at my house. And, and he said, this is the weirdest experience of my life. He says, I feel like I'm in a bubble. It's like, like I don't know what's going on in the outside world, you know, and, and I'm not picking up my phone. Like, and this, like, he, he was shocked. I mean, he loved it, but he says, I feel like I'm in a bubble. Shabbos is like, everything stops. You know, I'll just t tell you, just as an, uh, as an aside, um, I'll never forget. Very often people are hesitant to invite those who are less affiliated uh, to their house for Shabbos. And they're afraid. They're not comfortable. They don't know what they're going to see. You know, they don't feel like they have the first perfect Shabbos experience. Their kids are usually terrors, etc. Right? They don't want to invite, invite someone that, 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 you know, and that should be the entire impression what a religious person is. So she, the lady told me she was like, she was very nervous. And in particular, the person who ends up, and it's always like this, they, they don't come, you know, right at candle lighting. They're here they're like a half hour early, right? They show up, you know. And of course, that's when everything's absolutely out of control, right? Kids on the chandeliers, you know, you know, you can imagine the theme, the theme, right? Women run around in the house coats, and, like, you know, the man's like trying to get something finished, and it's madness, okay? And, and she's thinking to herself during this entire time, what is this person thinking? He, like it's, this is this is absurd, you know. And this is gonna this is an initiation to what a religious family is supposed to be. At any rate, you know, comes Shabbos. She lights the candles, and and and, uh, and the father takes the, takes the guy to shul, and he tells her afterwards that was the most incredible experience, because all of a sudden I never had anything like this. Everyone's panicking, panicking to get something done. All of a sudden. A number ticks on the clock, <laughs> and everyone stops. It's like, what? Like, what was that? Like, unbelievable. It's like as if someone had a gun to, to their heads. You know, the person was so impressed by it. You know, just the opposite. It was so impressed. They were so impressed. He was so impressed that that wow. Like this is like this is how this works. Like it's so important to get something done. And when the minute comes, you stop. And like that was that was really impressive. But again, this is, this is what Shabbos is. Shabbos is time to reflect and to really. Um, look within as opposed to without, right? That which is without. Um, in fact, on Shabbos, you're not allowed to run unless it's for a mitzvah. 
running is prohibited, right? Running is the weekday dynamic. Shabbos is the sitting dynamic. To sh- shev is to sit, right? Uh, Shabbos is, is, is time spent with the family, within. Can you hear why it's a female dynamic? This, by the way, is the secret why we call Shabbos always within female terms. Boyikala, boyikala, right? Come the bride, Shabbos Malchusa, the, right? The, 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 the queen, right? We're always referring to Shabbos in female terms because it's a capacity to, to recharge, well not just recharge, but create in, in the deepest way. You think you're accomplishing during the week, right? The man thinks he's accomplishing with all his great business endeavors, etc. And I'm just, again, I, sorry if, <laughs> I just, I broad brush, brush strokes here, but just to get the, the concept out. But meanwhile, but what really, the true accomplishment happens on Shabbos. That's what it really happens. Any, anyone will tell you that, that a child becomes who he is through, through Shabbos. It's a Shabbos table, it's a Shabbos experience. That creates, that creates the child, it creates, it creates, uh, it creates the, the person. Okay. Um, yeah, should we go on? And we, we, so we've got strength in the next level? Okay, so Ratzah V'Shaif are two, two dynamics that very often are, are fighting with one another. One is, again, is the, the, the capacity to run, and the other one is, is really being pushed back. And, and both want to achieve, if you will, but uh, they can't at the same moment, okay? There's a third, di- there's a third dimension, and I'll read, I'll read you what I wrote about it. Rats of Ashaif are fundamentally conflicting forces, constantly interacting throughout life. Rats and Shaif are experienced in the few seconds it takes to breathe, and in other identified as phases in a lifelong relationship, as I mentioned. Like magnets, these two powers can continuously repel and oppose one another, causing disharmony and misery, or they can fuse together like the attraction of opposite magnetic fields. When this is achieved, two distinct strengths function as one being, striving toward a common goal, while still maintaining their unique qualities. This essence, this, this is the essence of a beautiful marriage. The union enables the fulfillment of a higher purpose that could never be achieved independently. The third level carries the essence of both male and female, yet it forms an entirely new and brilliant entity. It is the birth of a child, a butterfly, a butterfly salvation, the time of Mashiach, peace, truth, and the embodiment of our patriarch Yaakov. Okay, so here, can, can you see what, how this is unfolding? Male, male and female, or what the deeper wisdom calls chesed and gevura, are two opposing um, dynamics. Chesed is to include and to embrace, while gevura is, is, is the power of, of a succeeding even when you, tremendous limitations are put before you. There is a combination of the two which is utter beauty, and that's called teferis. That's called, that's called beauty. And that's when you take the both of both of best best worlds and you put them together. And that's a child. A child is, is the best as, aspects of, of the of the mother and the father put together in one. It's it's you know if if shayv is a cocoon state which I mentioned right that that reality that 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 it experiences in in a very closed environment a butterfly would be to Ferris, right. And in general, this is this is the life. This is this is all of history. All of history can be found in these two or three dimensions, right? And finally, in the end of all time, it will all make sense to us. You know wh- where there's this where Teferis falls in, right? Now here we're always through life. We're always going back and forth. It's always a rats of Ishayf. but but eventually, in the time of Mashiach, there'll be utter clearly clarity, and we'll understand how everything falls into place. Right, the nine months, bef- the nine months that a woman is um, is experiencing the the trials of of, of pregnancy, you know, for uh, for a woman obviously gave birth, she understands it, but but uh, assuming someone doesn't know what's going on, it's utter, you know, can you imagine? She, she has no idea what's going on in, in with her, right? Um, that you know, you know, it's amazingly scary, and and it doesn't get better; it gets much worse, right? Until finally she's in labor, and it's like and it's like the, it's the end of the world. This is. This is the reality we all experience in, in the time of our, an ordeal. Even those that, by the way, that, that, that have been through it already, it's a difficult, difficult experience, right? Nonetheless, what gives us hope is the final, what's going to come in the end, right? Is that baby that's going to be born. That gives all of us hope. And that's, that's what is supposed to charge us throughout an ordeal. 
that, that even though we suffer through Ratz or or we experience it and thrive through it, the, the beauty in the end will, the ends will justify the means, if you will. This, this is how Hashem in the end, will, it will all make sense when the time of Mashiach comes, even though there's, there's been tremendous suffering um, throughout the ages, um, nonetheless in the end, somehow it's going to all make perfect sense. And we're going to look back and we're going to say, unbelievable, what incredible beauty this, this world is and what Hashem has accomplished. As this all ends with, with an analogy, they, they say the story, um, they say the story about, about uh, I believe it said actually about the Mizritra Magadha and the, and the Balatanya. When the Balatanya, the first Lubavitcher Rebbe was in prison, so, so he has, uh, and again, I'm, I probably don't have the, the details right, so, and, and there aren't too many Lubavitchers here that can put me in my place, so I'll just continue. Um, w- somehow there, there's a give and take now the, between the two. Now the, 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 Miz, the Mizritra Magad had already passed away. And, he, and the Balatanya sees a vision of him, I think in a dream. And he, he says to him, what's going on? You said that, that after you pass away, um, I believe that's how it goes, that, that, that after you pass away that, that there'll be no, there'll be no um, hardship for Pali Yisrael or something like this. So, so the, Bal- so the, the Mizritra Magad says to him, says, no, no, no. He says, he says, that's how I understood it when I was alive. But now that I've passed away and I see things with other clarity, so I can never try and change something that, that, um, uh, that I see as, as not, not positive. In other words, now that I'm in heaven, I see that everything that's happening in the world is positive. I wouldn't try and change it anymore. You have to do, you know, you have to do what you think is right in your position. But from my vantage point, from this bird's eye view, everything is just perfect, right? That bird's eye view, we won't get to the time of Mashiach in clarity. But it, it's important to at least know that, that Hashem has a plan. And no matter what's going on, whether it's in the Middle East or personally in our own lives, that it's a plan that will bring out incredible beauty in the end. So much so that we're not going to understand at all what we were suffering through before that. It's like looking at a beautiful newborn baby, looking, peering into his eyes, and then thinking back of how difficult the nine months are. In that moment, you don't think about it. In that mo- moment, you're, you're engulfed by the beauty of this, of this child. And that's, that's really, if you will, that's, I think, our, our, our <laughs> we'll begin this way with a uh, discussion of, of challenges in Ratzavishayv. And uh, hopefully Mitzvah Shem uh, will continue, I guess, next week.